it's time. All right, here we go. The cocktail show. Get ready to have a good time. Let's have a good time. This is exciting, isn't it? Oh, I like that. Hello, testing, testing, testing. Welcome aboard the Dream Rider. It's the only way to fly. Wow. <laughs> I've allotted one hour for recreational activity. There's no time for a relevant conversation. Fun will now commence. Cocktail show. Gary, Woo-hoo. Gary, Gary. Here's a young speaker who is really in demand. Don't let that go to your head, Gary. <laughs> but wait, there's more. I'm the guy. Finger guy. Three, two, one, zero. It's Todd Pickering welcoming you to the Gary Meyer Show Cocktail Hour Live! 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 Cocktails, woo, drinks. We're streaming live at 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 Central. On Friday, it's March 1st, 2024. And of course, no matter where you are, it's time for a digital mimosa. And we're celebrating something, and that would be the first day of spring. Spring is here. Thank God we can have some hope with something. The kneecap of winter will be broken on the show this evening. And since it's meteorological spring, the Epcot International Flower and Garden Festival is now underway over at the Walt Disney World Resort through May 27th. Yes, this is the festival best known for Disney's ever-increasingly elaborate topiaries including this year's entry display inspired by Disney's animated film Wish, which debuted this winter. Another new topiary display this year is Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy, complete with his own mixed tape. Last year's highly detailed Tiana topiary is back from Disney's The Princess and the Frog. And as always, Disney's first animated classic is represented, as are its most famous characters and of course Epcot's own character, Figment with lots of flowers all around the park. Disney invited me over for the festival's opening day earlier this week, and the daytime temperatures would have been considered summertime up north. For those of you in other parts of the country considering vacationing down this way, my newest neighbor, which is just across the street from Disney property, is the brand new billion dollar development named Evermore Resort. Folks there invited me over for a look at what they call Orlando's first ever beach paradise. They created an eight acre crystal clear swimming area, the Evermore Bay, along with 20 acres of beachfront activity area and surrounded all of that with accommodations from two bedroom villas all the way up to 11 bedroom houses, which sleep up to 32. And there's also a brand new Conrad Hotel along the water. I hope sharing these looks with you helps lighten the week's goo and gets this week's show started on a lighter note as the sun hangs around a bit more as we get the evening started. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Disappear. Disappear. Yep. The best way to watch this show is the Gear Force Live YouTube channel. YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Subscribe to the Gear Force Live YouTube channel. More eyeballs. It's a good thing. Please like and share the show on all the social media channels. Comments during the live show, wherever we are streaming, can be seen in our virtual studio. We may show them on the screen and or talk about them. Oof. And that's it. Now, fasten your seatbelts. It's time to go wheels up on the Gear Force Live. 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 The following may be disturbing on America's podcast. Boom. Shaka laka. Right. Hey, welcome to the cocktail show on the first day of spring, meteorological spring. I know some of you are into the, well, it's in three weeks. No, no, no. I'm starting today. And then next weekend, we set the clocks ahead. We're out of the woods. We've broken the kneecap of winter. And then next week, we're going to break the back of winter. And that's it. Goodbye. (sighs) Finger guns. Leslie, jump on so we can get the wheels up. we got to get going here. Got a lot to do. And I'm going to kick the tires. There's her finger gunning. Uh, Let's light them up. And like, okay, uh, Alan, the link of the uh, producer of this program, he should be the mayor of Orlando. He's the unofficial mayor of Orlando. <laughs> that guy does more to promote Orlando than I'm. Oh, yeah. Really, I'm putting him on a ballot or something. Great job on everything you do, Alan. Thank you. All right, you want to remove that condom? 
I do. I, I really, oh, really I do. I really, really want you to. Uh, got an Oyster Bay, Sauvignon Blanc. Love me All those right. New Zealand whites. Um, got a lot of buildup, so okay. fingers crossed there. this one's going to be there a good go. one. Three. And I'll even go without the protective glasses because wow. I'm feeling good. Okay, three, two. Oh, okay. that was good. Okay. That's nope. it. Cannonball it. Yeah. You, you've got all of that. You've got all of that. And the cat's okay. here to retrieve it. No, Tula. Sorry. I am dressed in honor of Richard Lewis tonight because the man liked black. And I thought, yep, Aww. I'm going to wear black. And if you've been listening the last few weeks, you know that two weeks ago on this evening, Richard was booked onto the show. And the day before, he got a hold of me and said, listen, I'm not really feeling up to it. Can we reschedule? I said, certainly. Wednesday, I'm getting ready to text him and say, hey, would you like to jump on this Friday tonight? And I figured with 48 hours notice, he would know how he's feeling. About five seconds after I'm getting ready to send that text, I get a text from my friend Dan, Richard Lewis is dead. And then you have that moment, ladies and gentlemen, and maybe you've had that moment where you go, I'm in a dream. This is not real. I'm going to take a breath and then everything's going to clear and go back to normal, and it didn't, and here we are. Whew. Wow, I'm still trying to digest this because Richard and I have been friends for almost 40 years, and this all came about when he came on the radio show I was on with my partner, and we both loved this guy so much we would have him on every time he was in town and then have him on the phone when he wasn't, but after that first appearance, Richard and I, we struck up a friendship right away because we both liked the color black. We had very similar senses of humor, and that was it. We were off to the races, and we just became fast friends. And we did all kinds of things together over the years that I'll never forget. One of those things was I was in Los Angeles, and we were getting uh, ready to go to dinner, and he said to me, I invited Albert Brooks to dinner. I don't think he's going to show up, but I invited him and I thought, you're kidding, Albert Brooks. I mean, now, we're, <laughs> now I mean, really, that's another surreal better, moment right there. We get to the restaurant and five minutes later, Albert walks in and now I'm, I'm like a little girl. Uh, what is happening? <laughs> this is not happening. And then for two hours, I'm sitting between Richard Lewis and Albert Brooks. I, <laughs> really? I mean, huh. does it get any better? No, and, that's and, pretty fantastic yeah. and, and that moment and we're going to show some pictures later when i was with richard and <laughs> you didn't do that thing where it's like um um defending your life that, that right. movie was really oh, cool now wait a minute albert had called into our show a number of times so we were friendly oh, with true. him enough to where i was in los angeles when he was filming defending your life i called his office to see if i could go sit on the set and watch them film i thought what i got nothing to lose sure and his his assistant said, no, Albert doesn't like people that aren't involved in the movie. It was filming in Orange County, which was probably about an hour from where I was staying because I was going to go down there and, and watch they him didn't film. Film it in purgatory? Oh, in purgatory so and heaven and all those other places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. And when Richard would come to the studio, the first five minutes was him setting up all of his pharmaceuticals. He had these vials of pharmaceuticals that he traveled with pills. I mean, it looked like a CVS pharmacy and eye drops. I, he had like, a defibrillator, I think an IV drip. I mean, he really came with all the medication uh, that he thought he needed. But like I'm saying, he's only 40 or something at the time, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. He oh, was, okay. he admitted yeah. he was a hypochondriac. Okay. And uh, <laughs> the, the lines that came out of his are unlike any comic I've ever heard. And I'll never forget some of these classics where he described his mother as a bowling alley with lipstick. Mm -hmm. I think of that. And then when he came into this nightclub that I was invested in, and I still don't know why I invested in it. But anyway, he was in town. I brought him over there. And you were there. You know, it had a lot of fabric and dark oh. wood and da-da-da. Oh, and, and art. And, and, and yeah, it, it yeah, had, yeah. I mean, kind of a, a groovy vibe, baby. Yeah. Yeah. And he walked in, and 10 seconds after he looks around, he looks at me. <laughs> it looks like a gay shipwreck. And I thought, <laughs> oh, my God, that's so perfect. 
in, in the way he views things and what he came with up with right there. I thought, oh, that's that's magnificent. So uh, yeah, so uh, I, I I don't know. I hear it was a heart attack. I don't know for sure. I haven't talked to his wife, but that's what came out because it wasn't as he had Parkinson's. He was diagnosed about a year ago for years before that he was dealing with this back issue. He was going through all these surgeries and he had a lot of back problems. And then the Parkinson's comes in, but there was no indication that he was on death's doorstep. Now, aren't we all, as they say? Well, and for a guy who, who is given the impression that he's on death's doorstep his entire life. Right. So you, you just kind of fold it in. Seriously. Yeah. Right. And I knew Parkinson's was not, you know, something that I would wish on anybody because it's slow and methodical. And I guess if there's any bright side to this, I didn't have to watch him and all of us didn't have to watch him go through the Parkinson's deterioration for a guy this vibrant with all of his other issues. And, I don't know if that's I, really, we talked about this on the T show today, the morning portion of this, where loved ones, when they're going through stuff and they're suffering, what, what is, what is the right thing to think? Do you want them to not you're, suffer? You're yes. entitled to think whatever comes to mind. It's, it's how you act on it. That might yeah. be questionable, but yeah, you can't keep those thoughts out of your head. It's that's yeah. just human. Yeah, yeah. And he had this TV sitcom he did with Jamie Lee Curtis for several years, Anything But Love. And I was in Los Angeles and I went to watch them film. I like watching people do what they do. And that's why my guest today, I'm so glad that oh, I, I have Brian Humick coming on because what we need really today is this man talking about Leave it to Beaver because that'll put my mind into a comfort zone. And my God, Brian's book, I was looking at stuff in this book He's going to, well, if you're a Leave it to Beaver oh. fan, you're going to be blown away. And even if you're not, I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Can you hold it up so we get a sense of just how big it is? That's I what mean... she said. <laughs> okay. There, there. It's almost 500 what? pages. That's what I mean. Right Look there. <laughs> I, and, and, oh, I, I was going through it and I'm chubbing out because I love that stuff. I like behind the scenes stuff. And we'll talk extensively about the book with Brian in just a few minutes. But uh, yeah, so uh, just kind of maneuvering through this week and and trying to find some kind of terra firma in all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good luck with that. Um, do you have some photos to share with us? Uh, do you want to put up the photos? Yeah, the Richard photos now. Aww. We're all going to get one of those. Someday, it's just um, that, as a matter that year, of fact, that second year, uh, the second, yeah. Uh, for for those of you who've been with us back to when we were on terrestrial radio and the podcast associated with that, um, I was in contact with Eric the Undertaker recently, and Eric um, is helping me get a marker for Tim's grave, and there was a question about whether we wanted to do it twofer but it would have required them to like put my name in stone with my birth year and just and leave the second it. thing blank and you and I didn't want do to do it. that no 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 it just yeah. knowing that that's out there i mean i know it's out there i i bought the piece of property <laughs> i mean but uh, <laughs> i had this no. discussion several weeks ago with this group that i'm in the question was if you could learn when you're going to die, the day you're going to die, would you want to know? No. No. I would, and some people said yes. They no. would like to make plans. They'd like to know if it's coming up soon. So they could, no, 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 no. I don't need to know that. No, no. I Let's live in a perpetual state mark. of denial. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so here we are by the pool time. in Los Angeles and uh, Richard... <laughs> Had to keep with the black. I I can't do black by the pool, so I'm going with the brighter colors, which is unusual for you. Now, there was a bit of a where's Waldo ness about this, and I think it's because of the color you're wearing that threw me off. <laughs> okay, we're in New York. Richard calls me. 
hey, I'm going to this party. Why don't you come with me? I go, okay. And this is the group shot of the party. You see Richard there at dead center. I'm in the red sweater. I've got a red and black sweater on. I guess I was getting into Satanism or something. I don't know what was going on there. Uh, but right it was your gang me, colors, right? Yeah, Richard my gang colors, the, right. The blood. So I do yeah. kind of pop, don't I, with that red? Nobody's got yeah. red. To, well, that well, and that's it. So I'm looking for the dark shirts right away. Yeah. So to my right is Larry David in the white shirt with the black collar. That's Larry David. Wow. Yeah. And that's before Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm. And so, yeah, that was a party we went to together. And and Richard uh, is? Dead center. There you go. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, well, this is life, right? You went through this last year when you lost your husband. I mean, it's it's one of those, I know we're all heading there. And I know. what do you do? Nothing. But the acceptance no, you, of it you, is is so foreign and hard and weird and yeah uh, yeah you, this is why you do your double beaver and we have yeah. a cocktail and um, yeah right that's what you got to do so I'm back to the Manhattan got the vermouth going again uh, and I know the they'll have guys some from, fresh Luxardos in the bottom there. Yeah, there's a Lux on the bottom, and the guys nice. from Oh Yes, the band Oh Yes, Matt and Brian, to you, because I know you guys like the Manhattan. Hey, we got to do a few of the um, comments, as we always do every week, and uh, I'll get the screen door out, and we can... That's not right, is it? No, look at you. Yay. No, no. You, no, you I had it backwards. There you go. Uh, I had it back. No, it was... <laughs> oh, this is kind of week I'm having. All right, uh, is Keely Ann up there? Did she check in? All right. Oh, yeah. First day of meteorological spring. From death comes life. Celebrate life while we can. Let loved oh. ones know they are loved. Don't assume they know. My schnauzer and I love the gear force. God bless all. Well, wow, there. Wow. That's a start. Even Keely's I... getting kind of esoteric. That's yeah. yeah. Martin, checking in from BC. Lloydster, thank you, Lloydster. Appreciate it. Brian from Oh Yes, a belated happy birthday. Leslie's birthday was, boy, okay, there's another thing. So Wednesday, I get the word that, that Richard died, and I knew that you were at your birthday luncheon. Right. And I thought, well, I'm not going to let you know because it'll ruin your lunch, and there's no need to do that. So there you have it. That was very kind of you, but... I came home from my birthday luncheon and I watched Jeopardy. I mean, talk, I, this day was such an insane roller coaster because then all of a sudden this, the news of Richard's passing started coming through. And honestly, it was also kind of surprising how much national pub he got. Yeah. Because I think he's yeah, part of that. It was on all that, the network newscasts at night and, and on the morning shows the next day yesterday and you know and we always mock the tina turner getting eight minutes at the top of the um uh david <laughs> we yeah old. david muir nobody's top tina turner's obit muir. on abc news with david muir first eight minutes first eight minutes which is usually reserved for wars assassinations and stuff but they did do a hefty piece on muir on on richard which was nice and maybe that's because name a really popular comedian these days. And, I, you know, uh, of course, Dave Chappelle or somebody like, but they're, you're not seeing this new crop of young comedians. Jeff Arturi, if you get a chance, he's pretty freaking funny. Um, What's his name? Jeff Artur Arturi. I'll get it. I'll get the spelling, but okay. okay. Um, but seriously, I think. Richard was kind of part of a like a golden age of comedy where cities had two and three and four really hopping comedy clubs and top talent from around the country yeah. were showing up. And you just don't feel that so much anymore. And in the time he visited with us in 2021, which we have queued up and ready to play as soon as you're ready, he talks about some of those old time stories about how he came up 
how he opened for headliners and uh, how he was on with Johnny and the risk he took on the Johnny Carson show that basically ensured that he appeared on Johnny Carson as much as he wanted over the years. Yeah. All right. We're going to roll this right now. So grab your fish sandwich from your local church. And Johnny from Michigan said that he probably would go to the stations of the cross instead tonight. Don't blame you. (laughs) We should maybe all go, but we're not. We're going to roll this tape. This is Richard from three years ago, huh, Alan? Two and a half, yeah. Here we go. I also like to be on with people who have helped my career for over 40 years. And all right, say 38. I don't want to age you. You've been you've been one of the most important people in my career. So well, thank you. I appreciate that. And you came on our radio show many years ago, and we immediately clicked as just humans and friends and things right, right away. And you and I hung out. And whenever I'm in Los Angeles, I like to hang out with you because I just find you a, a fascinating person and the, one of the funniest people I've ever seen on stage. Well, I, how is your? How is your? How, send my love to your wife and your daughter. How is your dog? Dog Flynn is great. We have a lot. We had, had to talk you into getting a dog. You yes, were really when, a, when I was in Los mean. Angeles a few years ago. You had just gotten a dog, and I thought you were the last person to get a dog, and you me could too. not be happier with this dog. And I thought, oh. wow, I never thought I'd see this. And then we got a dog, and I can't imagine my life without a dog now. I used to open up for big celebrities when I was young, and I hated it. I really hated it. Like Sonny and Cher, it was it was frightening. I don't even know how I had enough curl balls to do it you know we were doing fifteen thousand people in a like an imagine square garden type venues and i and i was not i wasn't that well known and in france not in montreal i was the guy went there's a little jew down by the i mean they had no idea what i was even supposed to do i thought i was they thought i was a tumbler you know and i so i got drunk at, in uh in montreal and i had a bad show and Sonny Bono said, said, you were a little loaded, weren't you? I said, yeah, well, you try to do a spoken word in front of 20,000 people. Are you out of your mind? But somehow I pulled it off. So the next time, the last time I ever opened up for a big shot, big celebrity, was in Wisconsin. They had 15,000 people on a hill drinking and eating ba- out of picnic baskets. And, you know, they're making about 200, not that they didn't deserve, a couple hundred grand a night. I'm getting $500 a week. I have to do a half hour. I was always petrified. I was breaking out. I had rashes growing out of my head like trees. It was horrible. And I always used to go to the venue to see what it was, what it was going to be like. So, and, and Sonny and Cher would get there five minutes before and go right on. I'm there an hour before, and I'm making $25 or more than that. But, you know, I'm not making much money. So Bono comes in, and he says, Louis, you're looking at the venue, right? I go, yeah, what, what, why are you here? So I, you don't go on for an hour. He says, I came here to see the fear in your eyes. And that got me so pissed off that I went on. I, this is the truth. 15,000 people, I destroyed them. And it was still light out. And that's murder for when you play outdoors. If it's still light out, there's so many distractions. But I destroyed that mountain. And when I walked back to my hotel, I said, I will never again open up for anyone unless people want to see me and i never did and that was like 1977 i said i'm not going to be a custodian for anybody that's that but at least i, I went out on, on decent terms your stand-up was not what other stand-ups are doing that's why i was so fascinated by seeing you the first time i thought i've never seen this kind of humor on stage because it's really you and and you're filtering all of your your maladies and psychosis and everything else into making it some kind of entertainment, which is it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. No, I don't know how I did it. I did do that somewhat. And, and a lot of people would say, hey, I'm nuts too. Thanks a lot. Love you. I mean, that, that they felt good about what I did. I feel good about the, the path I chose. And, uh, you know, and I'm able to do it in 12 seasons, but or 11 seasons, but I'm playing me. And uh, and it's it's a little, it's not, it is me. There's no question about it. But Larry puts me in, posi- in situations where I can humiliate myself. And I like to humiliate him. It's We just try to humiliate one another all the time. In fact, there's a Jimmy, he was on Jimmy Kimmel three, four weeks ago. 
and uh, it's easy to find. And he, he was great. And he showed a, a, a 28 second clip of the of the episode that I'm in. And uh, I was shot. I was. He wishes you would die. I think in that. In yeah, that he said, right? "When are you going to die? When are you going to die already? I, I can't take you. You depress me." When are you going to die? And Kimmel said, and he said, I was the only person in the world that he could say that to because we have such a strong friendship. But it was, so, I mean, I don't know what's, what he's going to say. I mean, I just knew we were, we were sitting at this scene and the, and the, uh, the only thing we were told that we start talking loudly and argue, action. And then I started mocking him. He started mocking me and he got so sick of me. He says, when are you going to die already? And <laughs> I mean, I, it took me by surprise, but it was a great line. I mean, I, you know, you know, it's when he, I'll tell you what, this is maybe inside baseball, but if there's like a lot of cameras shooting three or four people at the same time. There's always a camera on an LD and he's, he's like really, an, you know, he edits with the editor. He, he writes with the outline with one or two with the director and, you know, it takes months and months. So when he, when we're shooting, he knows he's doing three things at once. He he he, know, he wants he, one thing he says in his head is this funny? Will this make the cut? The other thing is you're getting off the subject. I'm going to waste. We're wasting our time, and uh, and then he thinks about the editing. I, I do I have time for one Carson anecdote? Yes, I I did. I had this monologue for years on the division of motor vehicles and it, it, it killed, it just killed. And it ran about five and a half minutes. And I had, you know, when you back in the old days in the seventies, you had a, Oh God, you had to go in there with the tape and play it for the talent guy, the coordinator. And then he said, I don't like that joke and forget another joke. It was just horrible. And, but you had to go through it when, before you had a name. And uh, so he okayed the division of motor vehicles routine and I get introduced and Carson was on and Burt Reynolds was there. And, and I, and, and, you know, usually those studio audiences are pretty square to be frank and Burbank, but this audience was like me at, at town hall at Carnegie hall. I mean, they were, it was almost like they were there to see me and I was blowing them away with this monologue. And the laughs were so loud and long that I, that I waited for them to dip. And then I went into the next line like a, a professional should. And midway through the monologue, I had no idea, no sense of time anymore. The stage manager went underneath the camera and went, I went, and I had to make a, I had to make a decision on the spot. If I, if I say good night now, midway through this monologue that I crafted for 10 years, it, I would never get on the show again. I would I would look like a mental case. So I said, I'd rather kill and go long and never go on again and have people say, why aren't you on with Johnny? I go, I was too good, man. I was just too funny. They don't want me. So I went long. The talent coordinator was screaming at me when I let, went backstage. He said, you'll never do this show again. And I was like, it was such a weird feeling. I mean, I killed. And yet I can't do the show again. So I used to go to the Palm restaurant after the Tonight Show. And I brought a date with me and my uh, two agents. And I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm crestfallen. And I look right across from me. And the chances were a billion to one because Johnny lived in Malibu. And this was Hollywood. Carson was there with his lawyer. And I was in shock. I still had the stage makeup on and Carson did. And when I saw him, I darted over to Carson's booth. And again, the fact that he was at the Palm after the show in Hollywood and not in, in a home or anywhere, any restaurant, was astonishing. It was a gift from the comedy guards. I ran over to him and he got you know nervous. I got on my knees and I pleaded my case. And I said, I know I went long. You're a pro. I'm a pro. I, I, I couldn't end it in, that, in mid midway. I, you would have thought I was a moron. And he was just nodding his head. And I, and the next day I get a call from that loudmouth talent coordinator. He says, you're a lucky man. You can come back whenever you want. And I, boy, that, wow. that, who, that changed everything. Then from there I went to Letterman, but I mean, the odds, that was really a, a you know, I, I had luck, man. I had Carson, I had Dave, I had Jamie Lee Curtis. And then I had, Let, and I, you guys, I mean, forget about, you know, you and a lot of radio personalities and other TV shows, but 
to have then to at 50 get asked by Larry to be on a show, you know, you yeah. got to have luck, you know, no matter how good you might be. This and I had all the luck in the world. This and, week, and, I was, and no small thanks to you either, Gary. Oh, hey, I, I'm happy to be your friend and, and promote your your deep, lovely comedy that I, I find so fascinating. Wow. Wow. Oh, okay. A um, couple things. That passage there on Curb, when you're going to die. And then the last episode he was on a couple of weeks ago, the exchange was... He's saying to Larry David, I'm going to leave all, when I die, I'm leaving everything to you. And that was the, the volley they were doing. So those things are always kind of weird after something like this happens. Yeah. But I it was, seems really funny and dark and silly at the time, but. Yeah. Uh, and then I was um, remembering when I did go to see him filming the Anything But Love sitcom, Jamie Lee Curtis's mother was sitting in front of me and that's Janet Lee who Janet was Lee. the woman in, in Psycho. So I'm yeah. sitting there looking at her thinking, oh, I remember you in the shower getting stabbed. <laughs> and I also- <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> the show was Chicago-centric, so I brought Richard a lot of Steve and Gary, our show's merchandise, to put on the set, and he did. So our coffee cup or whatever was always on the set during the taping. Oh, that's so yeah. good. I didn't know Everybody that. promoting there. So, yeah, <laughs> that's what friends do. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so um, there's a void in the comedy universe now. Yeah. He, like it was I so said, unique it. what he did. Such a, a different path, and it wasn't political, and it wasn't blue. It was its own universe of comedy. No, it, this is also uh, reminding me of something else that we are are now seeing when these comedians are on a, a late night talk show. It looks so scripted. Yeah. And here you get a, a sense that like Richard was free forming. Oh, you sent me a, a, a bit that he did on Carson and what it, it was like nine minutes of him pretty much just kind of yeah. trying to mention that his mom like, called I'm, before you're right. the show. It doesn't sound like I've been rehearsing this routine for a year and now I'm going to peddle it for the next three years on stage. Then, he was riffing off of what Carson said right. and he was saying that his mother called him right before he came out on the Carson show and he goes, oh, I'm excited. I'm going to be on with Johnny Carson. And she said, is there anybody else on the show? <laughs> yeah, who else is on there? Uh, and, that, you know, and, and, and these days yeah. it's all the wind up the pitch, and you can yeah, see the it, joke coming from a mile right, away. Right, because they've been here doing it for eight years. And here, Johnny, you could tell, was just sitting back and going, let it right. roll. Right, and then at that point, Johnny released the issues he had with his mother, if you caught that, because he said, <laughs> exactly. yeah, I had this same issue with my mother. I, I would call her, and she'd go, so what are you doing these days? And I remember him saying, and this must have been right below the surface where he needed to get it out in public. He was saying one day how he had this issue with his parents once in a while where he got this governor's award in California one year and he called his mother to tell her. And she said to him, I remember this quote, he, he said, she said to him, well, I guess they know what they're doing. <laughs> wow. Ow. And you hear Ow. these issues with these huge celebrities with their mothers. And Barbara Streisand, I guess, had this issue where she, her mother thought she was a shitty singer. And my God. Sweetheart, if you just got that nose fixed, you might have yeah. a different sound. And, which is why she never got her nose fixed, because she said it would have changed her voice right. tremendously. I think I got my sense of humor from my mother. She's the AM of AM and FM. My mother was Angie Meyer, my father, Frank Meyer. So I had parents whose initials are AM and FM. What else could I do? Because my mother's sense of humor is really bizarre. I mean, and I guess that's what I have. Uh, but Okay. Thank goodness uh, for that. All right. So um, I hope and you enjoyed that. And so we laughed, so we do not cry. Uh, by that's the way, it. that comedian I was telling you guys about is Jeff R. Curry. It's A-R-C-U-R-I. Okay. It's so nice to actually see somebody who's not afraid to work an audience and maybe be a little politically incorrect and just go, fuck it, go for the no. joke. 
All right. Well, also, I spilled I half the bottle of wine on my lip. <laughs> that's not yeah. going to do you any good. Oh my god! I... Was, uh, we are assuming that's the wine. Okay. I, I I am soaked here. But wow! Anyway. Now is it all gone? Do you have a drinking problem? Well, the problem <laughs> is I spilled half my bottle, so yeah. I do not have a problem. But yeah, there's okay. there's some issues going on yeah. here. All right, so. Uh, oh, one more thing. A listener sent me this clip. Remember the TV show Candid Camera back yeah. in the 60s? Yeah. Richard was on that as a 16, 17-year-old kid. Not really? because he was a comedian, because he was 16. He was in high school. Right. And the, I don't know how he got on the show, but it's out there. Look for it, because it's really unbelievable to see this 17-year-old Richard Lewis on Candid Camera. The bit was some counselor, they had done an aptitude test and they were trying to decide which direction he should go in life. And the guy goes, well, I'm looking at your uh, your answers to everything. And I think manual labor is the only way you should go. And Richard's looking, what? what? Manual labor? <laughs> what am I going to do? Yeah. You should work so, in a mine. Um, yeah, so Google that. What do you want to bet? That had some influence on why he pursued that career. Because didn't you call into a radio show as a Ute? I sent and, a letter and it got read. Yeah. And and it's those sort of things that spark, plant yeah. the seed. Yeah. 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 All right, here we go. Let's um take care of business because I want to set everything up now for Brian and talk about the Leave It to Beaver book he's written. Uh, first, if we're ready, and then we're gonna uh, talk to Ryan and then Brian. Okay. You got that? Alan, you uh -huh. want to do the commercials right now the green flag is up and we are rounding turn one on our new lockport location look for bettenhausen's new state-of-the-art facility opening spring of 2024 for your immediate vehicle needs find what others already know it's better at bettenhausen your best car buying experience starts at bettenhausen on 159th street in tinley park bettenhausen the midwest's highest volume dealer has over 400 new vehicles to choose from shop now at BettenhausenCDJR.com. Yep. And David Hochberg and his team will help you out with the mortgage biz that you are maybe seeking as far as getting a mortgage, reverse mortgage, a veterans loan, all that stuff. They know free consultation. There are the numbers and they want to save you money if that appeals to you. Okay. I think I just heard that the mortgage rate is getting close to 7% again. Um and yeah. whatever the mortgage rate, David just knows how to work yeah. that to your best advantage. And he even yeah. says, like, if you've done business with him, he'll call you back in months when the situation has changed and say, you know. All right, let's refi. Let's do something. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Ryan, you're not pre-recorded. I'm not. I, it was a busy week coming off the week of uh, weekend of bowling with Hank at the state tournament. So, um, and how did he do? Well, the tournament goes on all for another the rest of the month. So they said two to three weeks, they'll let you know how the score did, but he was the, one of the younger kids bowling there and he held his own for that. So, okay. And then the weirdness is when I checked in the hotel, again, we're not staying at the four seasons. They I, we get in the room and the toilets plug. And I called the front desk and say, hey, the toilet's plugged. We have a complimentary plunger. Uh, would you like to come down and get it? You're kidding. His name no. should be Bob, and he should be no. showing up in a minute. A, a complimentary plunger as opposed to come down and buy a plunger? I, I don't know. So I go down there, and he said, ooh, my plunger's not around. It might be in the storage room. When I'm done checking in, people, I'll bring it to you. And there's like a line of people. So we never thought it would come, but it ended up coming. So it was just kind of a little debacle. So you had a plunge it yourself. I did. And it but didn't it was work. was somebody else's clog. It didn't work. It, and I think they ended up just throwing paper towels in there. So the plunger didn't work. So I ended up just sticking my hand in a shopping bag and pulling it out. Oh. So that, there you that, started the, that started the weekend at the Best Western. But other and than that. Uh, yeah. Okay. I have some pictures. I don't know if you All want right. to pictures now yeah. or. Okay. This is, I think, what Leslie talked about seeing on oh, yeah. Jeopardy. Set this up, Leslie. So here it is. Birthday. 
Best of times, worst of times, best of time. You know, I'm on this emotional roller coaster and everything is seeming surreal. Just get the news that Richard Lewis has passed away. And then this shows up as the final question in the first round of Jeopardy on the 28th. <laughs> this so. dance music was big in 1977 by 79. A demolition night promo at Comiskey Park led to a bonfire in the center field and a riot. There you go. They got it right, by the way. Which How part? cool is that? Dude, oh, you somebody made it got out the to answer. Jeopardy. They answered it. The, the person who buzzed in got it right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, which is cool, too, yeah. as opposed to, like, it, it sucks when it's a minor celebrity and everybody's standing around going, oh, I don't know. That, that can't be good for your ego. This one, though? Boom, they got it. Disco, and everybody's like, yeah, disco demolition. So, yay okay. you! <laughs> Weirdness continues. Well, uh, this one is a re reference to the story that went completely sideways on Wendy's this week. I don't know what the fuck they were thinking <laughs> on this uh, surge in pricing. And yes, now they're doing damage control. And I'm wondering if somebody got fired over this. So this is using Gecko, <laughs> Gordon Gecko, to uh, do the Wendy's uh, spiel. When I buy a Baconator on the dip, <laughs> short the sandwich at 12.15 and turn a 27% profit. That's in essence what Wendy's was trying to push out there and went no, nowhere. Oh, this is to save you money. Exactly. We're all we're going to make it more affordable for you in these other hours. That's mm -hmm. what we meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And this is a great idea because the Waffle House is the hurricane indicator. If the Waffle House in the neighborhood in Florida, say, stays open when the hurricane's coming, that means you're going to be okay. If it closes, the Waffle House never closes during hurricanes usually. Put it on a pontoon boat, and then you don't have to worry. <laughs> right. No worries at all at right. a hurricane we'll and a pontoon thing. boat. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We don't care. <laughs> And Johnny, Johnny got a new haircut. He sent me a picture. He's at the Stations of the Cross tonight, but he likes his new haircut. Okay, Johnny from Michigan. A little blonder. He got yeah. some yeah. color in there. He's getting yeah. ready for spring, yeah. nice. for Easter. And I got this uh, <laughs> from a listener, viewer, <laughs> OnlyFans. That's before it got hijacked and became the uh, the nudie channel. Uh huh. It's Did OnlyFans. You did you want to go to the ones we have from last week, or do we want to save those for next week? I'll save those because okay. I got to get going on okay. things. Oh here. my gosh! Yeah, we still have a really important interview. We oh we yes, do. we do, and that would be with Mr. Brian Humick, who wrote the world famous Beaverpedia, almost five hundred pages of Leave It to <laughs> Beaver stuff. Welcome, Brian. Hi, Gary. Hi, Leslie. How y'all doing? As okay. I've been saying for. Years, I start my day with a double beaver on me TV, which is in about every household in the country. And actually, I start before Leave It the Beaver with that uh, tune right at the next corner or uh, tune rights don't make a wrong or uh, tune me up, tune me down. That show, the cartoon show. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. That show last month, I think, jumped the tuna because <laughs> they honored Black History Month. And I'm oh. thinking, wait, wait. It's a cartoon show. What, Echo and Jekyll are reading the Emancipation <laughs> Proclamation? What, Popeye's going to beat the shit out of a racist? No, you're kidding me. What, Elmer Fudd's on the back of the bus? He's not going to, he's <laughs> going to the front of the bus? What? They did. I don't know how they did it, but they acknowledged Black History Month on the on the Toonie show. Oh, my hmm. goodness. Toontown or whatever it's called. So <laughs> then I get into Leave it to Beaver, and it's comfort, and I start my day with some semblance of a heartbeat that isn't racing, or should we talk about Hamas or long COVID or Ukraine or frozen embryos or the border? I mean, my God. <laughs> so you must have heard that and said, hey, I've got the encyclopedia. Would you like it? Oh, yeah. And then I thought, I got to have this man on the show. How, Brian, how did you arrive to do this book? Well, it all, um, it all started about 10 years ago. I wrote a devotional book and I used every episode from season one to, um, to get and use something from the Bible to relate to each episode. 
And um, I had an encyclopedia of um, actors and directors at the back of that book um, of all season one up um, actors. And so then I um, thought over the years, I'm like, why couldn't I do that with other episodes, other seasons, like season two, three, and do the same kind of thing. But then in about 2022, I think it was, um, I, I just said, okay, let me just put all that stuff together, do all six seasons and encyclopedia of the actors. And let me maybe just figure out everything else in the show to just write about and uh, even have summaries in there too. But, but yeah, there's like 468 actors that I um, did um, little biographies for ones I interviewed or ones that just had a lot more of a, you know, bigger part in leave it to be where I, you know, of course I wrote bigger, bigger biographies, but so there, I mean, that's how it started was with that devotional book years ago. And how did the devotional book tie into Leave it to Beaver? And then Eddie Haskell comes up to Jesus and goes, Sam, remove the rock. How, what, what was that? <laughs> well, and the funny thing you mentioned, Ken Osmond, um, is that years ago he was on a Stu Showstack. Um, Stu Showstack. He's um, a, co a TV um, blogger, a podcaster. And he um, had Ken Osmond on there. And he had all the guys on there, actually. Um, so that's how I really got into knowing all about them and their details of their lives. And so I was at church on a Wednesday night and I skipped out of um, the Bible class, went to the church library and was listening to watching this podcast or listening to the podcast of um, with Ken Osmond on there. And I got to email them and say, Hey, I'm skipping out on church watching this. And they, he read that email on the air and Ken Osmond had told me, Oh, God bless you, Brian, you know, for skipping church. And you're probably going to go to hell now for listening to us. And, and so, you know, it was just, um, one of my treasured memories is having Ken Osmond actually say, God bless you, Brian, to me. And so, I mean, I love, love Eddie Haskell, but yeah, um, I do mention Eddie Haskell in that devotional book sometimes, but it was really weird. I mean, you could actually find some things that would relate to Christianity in each show because they're, as Jerry Mathers says, they're, they're mini morality plays. Each episode is. And so there is a lot of, a lot of things you can find in there that you can relate to the Bible. And I could have done that for all six seasons, but I decided just to go, whole hog right into a, an all topics, everything about Leave it to Beaver with this encyclopedia. And whole hog it is. If you're a Leave it to Beaver fan, this is as if the equivalency of, of having a mound of cocaine in front of you. It's <laughs> everything you can imagine. For example, oh. uh, of the 437 phone calls made or received during the six seasons by the following characters, the percentages of calls are received made or received by each one. Ward Cleaver, 29.7%. June Cleaver, 29.2%. Uh, Wally, I mean, it, what the, Mike, how did you figure all this out? And we're assuming it's all true. Oh, yeah. No, 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 it's not fake news. Um, I guess you could say I just wanted to retire early, and I did for about almost maybe five months of my life. You know, it's just it was all I did. I mean, I was watching every episode and sometimes multiple times. Um, I, I cataloged everything. I had a, a spreadsheet, you know, on one lap on my computer. I had the show on a laptop next to me and I had like 160 different, you know, columns where there's something I could have marked down from each episode. Now each episode didn't have that much or I'd still be researching it, but it was about 50 or 60 different things from each episode. I wrote in a column. There was something I could write down. And so it, it took forever, but I just, I guess one of the things I always wondered about, and it's funny because I didn't even put it in the book, which was you always hear Wally talking to Mary Ellen Rogers, his girlfriend on the phone, or I'm going to go over to Mary Ellen Rogers, or, oh, she called, or I'm talking to her. And I, um, I want to know how many times did Mary Ellen Rogers was she mentioned, but she wasn't in the show. And, um, Thing is, that's what kind of one of the things that inspired me, and I never even put that in a book. Okay, did I read this correctly? That the show was never in the top thirty in the ratings, right? Yeah, that's that's never true. Never in the top thirty, but at that time, being say the thirty-first show, still had probably ten million to fifteen million viewers every week, right? Well, right, and I and I did. I don't know if I put this in the book either, but it, I did see some research that showed that among um, younger viewers that it was in a top 10, one of the top 10 lists um, for one year, at least, you know, along with Andy Griffith and some other shows. So it, it may not have been for overall viewership, but for younger people, it was, even though it wasn't even a, a youth show, you know, basically. 
the first season was on CBS, then it got canceled, right? Then went to ABC for the yeah. next five years. Yeah, next next five years went to ABC and and it had a change also in studios. It started off at Republic Studios for the first two seasons. And then in the four following seasons, it went to uh, Universal Studios. I did the Universal tour in 1974 specifically to see the Beaver House. Have you? Oh, wow. Did you ever do that? It's gone now, right? Yeah, right. They they put it even in the last few years. It was back in a back 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 lot, and it just fell into disrepair. And they eventually just um, what I've heard is they tore it down recently. I mean, maybe in the last two years, and yeah. just to make room for more things. And um, what I can't understand is why, with all the fans out there, I mean, I'm a member of a Facebook group that's all Leave the Beaver centric. 25,000 fans and I know we could have gotten a you know some money together to buy that facade stick it somewhere I mean we would have there's a lot of people that would have loved to have that I mean you would have loved to have that I would I'd put it in the backyard <laughs> I'd, I'd really and pretend the seasons were 39 episodes long right I, they don't do five ten episodes oh, on a lot of series now 39 episodes a season that's a lot of work and I mean yeah I mean so um, <clears throat> when I was researching it, I saw that um, they did uh, 50 or 13, 39, 49, 52, uh, 52 episodes they had a contract for. And um, what it was, it was 13 episodes in the summer that they would rerun. The producers would pick out 13 of their best episodes and would stick that in the rerun area in the summer. But yeah, it went from October 4th, you know, 1957 was the debut. And then it wouldn't end until June. That was the last first run part of the series. So yeah, you're right. 39 episodes. That's a lot of lot of TV. And thank God, be, thank God for that. They what? I said thank God for that. I mean, I love yeah, it. Yeah, because people. now the way they run these shows, if they do, I think 22 is the standard. Mm -hmm. But cable shows, 10, 12 episodes. That's a season. Right. The principal actors did not make a ton of money i'm guessing do you know the financials of any of this from what i understand is there was it was either maybe up to three or eight reruns that they got paid for you know that's it, was it. Like, that's it i mean nothing and ken osmond until the day he died i think he was still fighting sat um was it sag or whatever or somebody that they wanted to get more money they wanted to get they they were sued sat the screen actors guild was sued about residuals for our older actors and i think they went back to 1974 and said okay every actor you know back to 1974 we're going to have tv shows then we're going to go ahead and give you some more residuals and it's like well what about the people in the 60s and the 50s and they were just out of luck i mean frank bank uh, who played lumpy and ken osmond they were two big people that sued you know sued the screen actors guild to get that money and never never happened for them or any of the actors. Think, well, well, think about this, where you do this work, and 60 years later, it's still printing money. You oh, get yeah. nothing. This is a show that's in multiple countries. How many countries is this run in? Oh, man. Okay, so I only found proof maybe about five or six different countries where, you know, you could say that people got fan, that people would say they got fan mail from, or Jerry Mathers will say, it's been, you know, um, translated into maybe 80 different languages and been broadcast in hundreds of countries, 100, 150 countries. I just can't find any proof of that. So I couldn't put that in my book. But I did put down that at least, you know, in Germany and England, maybe Poland. Um, but, you know, there's stories about it being sent, copies of it sent to Africa and the bush pilots would send it and take it out to little villages everywhere. I mean, you just don't know. You can't yeah. prove it. You can't prove a negative, I guess. But the point being, it's running for 60 years after it finished. And Jerry Mathers, who's the only surviving member in the main, main group. Right, right. Sitting, I don't know what he thinks. Have you talked? You've met him, right? I met him, but I didn't get to talk to him much or whatever. I did hear that he loves the book because a fan took it to him or talked to him about it at one of these fan conventions. Um, and I met him at a, a convention like that, but didn't get to talk to him, haven't been able to interview him, but there's so many interviews with him online that, I mean, 50, 60, 70 of them. And so I got to watch them all and learn about him and write about him from that point of view. Um, but, I mean, yeah, no, this is the longest running, longest running sitcom in history. Now, continuously running. 
Uh, I Love Lucy had a little hiccup with some with rights issues, um, and they had to be off the air for a little while. But Leave It to Beaver, once it went on the air on October 4th, 1957, has never been off the air anywhere, ever. Really? Always been on on um, reruns. Um, that first se- that first year, it was syndicated after it went off the air. So it had summer episodes and, in 63, and then it stayed on the air through um, syndication in about 12 stations. So a Jerry Mathers looks at a Jerry Seinfeld. A Jerry Seinfeld mm-hmm. goes to the mailbox every year, gets a check for $60 million. <laughs> oh Although God. Jerry was a co-producer with Larry David, and there's a, a lot of other stuff there, but still... I mean, compared to then, 50s, the 50s and 60s, these modern sitcom stars, the people on Friends, they negotiated a million dollars an episode in the final two or three seasons. Right. And well, getting and, a taste of the syndication. Well, and, and the thing is, you know, so they didn't, they don't get this, these residuals at all. So they, um, you know, a lot of them, these actors will go to these Hollywood shows. Like right now, today in Burbank, California, there's the Hollywood show going on. It happens maybe four of them a year. And so you've got about 100 actors. I think right now it's 100 actors. you got two Leave it to Beaver actors that are there right now signing autographs. And these autographs are, you know, to some people might be pricey. You know, sometimes it's anywhere from $25 to $40. I saw one actor charging $80 um, for an autograph. Not a Leave it to Beaver actor. They may be $30 each for Rich Carell, who played Richard Rickover. He's there today and tomorrow. And so is Jerry Mathers. And Jerry's there with his wife. He goes to all these shows. And so fans everywhere get pictures taken with them. They get autographs. And excuse me, they they get some money for that. So, I mean, rightfully so, since they can't get any residuals. My brother went to one of those and got a picture with Jerry and Tony Dow, Wally. And it was $50 each. And he said it was the best money he ever spent. When you're going to these, you're going with the affection for these shows and these people. So I don't think you mind paying what would be some people would consider a little too much. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's that that feeling of, oh, I got to be with this person, I got a picture. Mm-hmm. What is that worth to people? Well, whatever you can get. Oh yeah, and for me, I mean in it was in November, right right when the book was finished, I finished the book and I had a sample copy and Amazon, I do publish it through Amazon and they didn't used to do this, but now they put a little this is a test pr- uh, printing or whatever uh, across the pat- across the front. I guess so um, people can't buy, authors can't buy sample copies and then sell them themselves. But so I took it over there and I gave it to Jerry Mathers. I gave it to Rich Carell. I gave it to Pamela Beard, who played Mary Ellen Rogers. Um, gave it, I think, to um, the boy, the guy who played Tui, um, Wally's friend also. And, um, you know, they, and they love it and everything. Man, what was the question? What was the question? What were you saying? I can't even remember. People paying to get the oh, autograph. Yeah. So it was worth the drive from Dallas, Fort Worth to Tennessee. I mean, all that gas money. I mean, it was worth it. I mean, just getting to sit there and talk to Rich Carell, who I talked with the most. That guy can talk. I mean, he is, he's amazing. So interesting. He's a, a ventriloquist or has been a ventriloquist. And I heard that you do that. And um, Oh yeah, I'm a vent. And he, so um, he, I mean, it's just so interesting. And it was just great to sit there and I, I sat there with Pamela Beard behind her table with her for quite a bit because um, we became friends just by interviewing her for about an hour and a half one day and just really wonderful woman. And then next to her was Veronica Cartwright, or Ver, you know, Veronica Cartwright, who played Violet Rutherford. And, um, you know, she was talkative, really friendly. And so getting to talk to her a bunch, um, she gave me her French fries that day, you know, at lunchtime. I mean, it was just really neat. I mean, just to be around all those people is awesome. Right. Wasn't she in the movie The Birds? Yeah. I mean, she's got a great That's Veronica career. Cartwright, right? Right. Yeah. And um, she, and her sister was in Lost in Space. Yeah. And, and so she was really interesting to talk to. And um, she I'll had bet. tons of pictures from all sorts of things. Let me uh, go back to Richard. I saw a passage in the book. August 9th, 1969, he's driving in Los Angeles, 3.30 in the morning. That's him, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And it's, it's, tell, the, tell this story. It's pretty chilling. Well, he was um, in at his girlfriend's house in the Hollywood Hills where Manson had you know, just recently killed um, Folger. Sharon Tate. And, yeah, Sharon oh, Tate. Her friend, yeah. And so he had left his girlfriend's house there in the Hollywood Hills, 
and was at a stop sign, a stop sign. And I don't remember what corner it was. I think I wrote the story in the book or, or at least I told it on a blog of mine. And, um, there was these loud mouth kids, these, um, you know, rock and rollers, long haired hippies, he thought blasting their rock and roll. And they're like right in front of him. At the stop sign. And, um, and then he noticed the next day when he heard about the news that that was them. That was the, the Manson gang that had killed them. I mean, he did. I don't know if he knew, you know, of course, who they may have been, but they he he saw them. He, he put us together after he saw the news the next day. He yeah. was right next to them. Exactly. I mean, what would have happened, he said, I think in an interview, if they had gotten out and chased him after because he's staring at him. I mean, he yeah. would have ran into the Lloyd, um, uh, last name escapes me, but the estate that he was just in, he would have gotten away from him because he knew it back and forth. But so it was just um, you know, Harold Lloyd, the Harold Lloyd estate. And he was going out with his daughter. And so that's why he was there leaving at 3.30 in the morning. And I think on the, the blog I have, on the classic TV blog, I put in there, um, was Richard, to make no confusion, Richard Richard Carell did not, you know, was not involved with the Manson murders or did not have anything to do with them or know anybody. But there are rumors that get started, and I wanted to nip that one in the bud, and that was he was just there leaving, going home, and saw that that night. So he had that guy has such an interesting life. You've got to interview him someday. Yeah, okay. And uh, like the other rumors, Jerry Mathers died in Vietnam, that kind of stuff that oh, floated right. around for years. Okay, we had that tone there at the top of the hour, news, traffic, sports, weather, <laughs> back in 15 minutes. All right, I got to get to Larry Mondello, okay. who I think with – Beaver, that was the Lennon and McCartney comedic percussion that was, for me, the best part of the show. Mm -hmm. And then Larry is gone, and you hear these things if you are interested about why he left. I heard initially that his family moved to the East Coast, and that was the end of his little TV career, but it, it's not the case, right? No, no. He stayed in Hollywood for about you know, three or four years afterwards. So he still had bit parts. I think, you know, he was in The Rifleman, was one of the shows, and he played a bully in that one, beating up some kid, beating up the main character, I think, in The Rifleman. And um, so, no, yeah, that was a rumor that got started that his family just moved. And a lot of people, you, you watch these Facebook groups, and people will say things that they go, this is why. It absolutely was this, when they don't really know. It's just something they may have heard, and they really, really believe it. And so the other rumor was that his mother was really a pain in the butt to the producers, demanding things, going up to their, in their bungalow saying, Hey, I want my son to have this or this or this. Um, that was spread by, you know, Barbara Billingsley did like a three hour interview with the Academy. I don't know, some, some um, great interview she did though. But, and she said, no, Larry, we loved Larry, but his mom was really a pain in the neck. And, um, and so, Ken Osmond would repeat that same thing. So did, you know, Tony Dow. So did Frank Bank. Now, um, Jerry Mathers would say that he went on to do movies, but that, that wasn't the case. That's never been the case. He did the movies before he became a Leave it to Beaver character. And, um, and then there's um, Rusty's story is that he just wanted to be a normal kid. And I got to interview him and talk to him for about 90 minutes one day. And, and he, um, he explained it to me. I Now, I'd heard him tell, it was told that he told someone else that, but then um, I wanted to hear it straight from him. I didn't want to print something that I didn't hear straight from someone's mouth. So um, I did eventually, after 10 years of trying to reach him, um, I reached his wife one day and hung and said, hey, I wanted to get your address, confirm it so I can send you a copy of the book. And um, and then 30 minutes later, he called me back and we talked. And it was wonderful. That's always weird, isn't it? When you're look talking to somebody that you have in your mind as this person from 60 years ago on this TV show. I had that happen with Eb from Green Acres. Oh, we called the house one day. And it, it's a it's a very surreal moment. Come yeah, on, yeah. Mr. Douglas. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I don't know if he sounded like he did when he was younger, but Larry didn't didn't really sound the same. The, the, I would imagine know. not. He was about eight years old at the time. But but some of the others I did talk to did sound like their characters from then. Rich Carell pretty much sounds the same. Yeah. Um, Stephen Talbot, who played Gilbert, sounds exactly the same. Um, does so, Rusty know in his mind, does he admit that he was comedy gold on that show, that that, that fizz was not replicated after he left? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I didn't really talk to him about that, but I remember one time wanting wanting so much to let him know that everybody loves him so much. I mean, he is amazing. He's everybody's most pretty much most loved character. And um, but yeah, I mean, I did let him know that that he's got so many fans out there, and so um, and I think he knows it now because he's friends with a a gentleman who, or he knows a gentleman that runs one of these groups, and um, so they would correspond, and he would ask him so many questions. He would email um, this gentleman back, the moderator of the group, and or the administrator, and so you know he he knows how loved he is. Good, and every now and then they would do a weight joke on his character. And when you look at him, he's maybe five pounds heavier than he should be. That's the funny part. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not on the show. He wasn't that heavy. And, and, and I think I did even go into the weights, the different weights that are mentioned in my book somewhere, maybe about Larry's weight. And yeah, you got it all. You, I mean, really every person that was on camera on that show, every person, no matter how small the part you've got cataloged in your book. Yeah. Even there's even got, the, this, this, the, Brian, the stuff you have in this book is, is mind blowing. You have, all the foods they either ate or talked about. Mm -hmm. that's, there's a whole list of that. Every piece of that show is in your book. Yeah, there. Um, there's even one uncredited actor. There was an episode, um, Substitute Father. I don't know if you see, remember that one where Wally's kind of in charge of the house because Ward leaves. He's seen in one of the early, episode, early um, scenes, and then he's gone for the rest of the show. And so Wally's kind of the man of the house. And in that episode at the beginning, Beaver is um, bully, you know, tripped by a bully. And he even has a speaking part, this bully does, and he's not in the credits. He's not in Internet Movie Database. He's not in the TV credits. And one of the ladies, um, her name was Leilani, Leilani Sorensen. She was an actress in a few episodes, an extra, and then also had a couple speaking parts in a few other episodes. And um, she told me, oh, that was my brother, Ricky Sorensen. Um, he, he died young of a cancer of a tumor. And, um, but I went and I redid my, one of my, my early, um, editions of the book and added him specifically, you know, put him in there and, um, actually made a little video about him called uncredited and have that on my, um, my leave it to beaver books website, which you can see here. If you can, or no, it's leave it to beaver books.com. You can see it. If I missed it, maybe I missed it, but it seems like they never did a Christmas episode. You're right. They do, you know, and why? I do mention, and and nobody knows exactly why, unless we would have been able to talk to the the producers, which unfortunately died too long, too many years ago. Um, some people say it could be because of syndication. You you don't want something to, you know, make syndication more difficult, or maybe I don't know. How does that make it difficult? I don't know. Maybe because you, it's not going to be Christmas when it's shown. I mean. It should Walmart be. does a, 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 a cash business on showing Christmas all year. They don't right. care. Exactly. And back then in the 50s, 57, this is when it started. Things were totally different, probably. But there are Christmas references. You know, um, I saw an episode the other day where Beaver is singing Jingle Bells while they're fishing. And, um, and then they've got one of the early episodes, the haircut. Remember when Beaver did his own haircut and then Wally helped him? And um, he was going to play an angel in the, the Christmas pageant. So you have a Christmas song being sung there, too. You have Hark the Herald Angels Sing, I think, at the Christmas play. So that's the only episode where Christmas is actually seen, maybe. And that's the right. One. There's no decorating. There's nothing where right. today shows all have some Christmas reference if it's getting to that holiday or oh, exactly. Halloween or whatever. Yep, exactly. Tell us uh, how the name beaver came about it's part of the 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 nuts and bolts of the show on why he's called beaver right hold on drinking what are you drinking drinking, drinking 100 proof chocolate milk today look out now so it's heb brand i love it i, I would much rather have oberweiss because i'm from chicago area and um but that's just heb uh, so um yeah beaver now there's a couple different reasons why it's said in the show. Um, there's episodes where my brother couldn't pronounce it, saying Wally couldn't pronounce it. I mean, that's I guess that's the main reason he couldn't pronounce Theodore, and somehow it came out Beaver. Uh, doesn't make sense that it would come out Beaver, but that's what the the storyline is. Now the the co-creator Joe Conley supposedly had a friend in the Merchant Marines named Beaver. And that is maybe named after one of his friends. We don't know if that's the case, but 
it's a possibility. So that's the only place we think that maybe Beaver came from. It was one of his friends. Name some of the classic episodes that, that you would consider classic. And I'm going to guess it's when Beaver got caught in the big soup bowl on the billboard. That's one, right? That's the most classic, most iconic, what people call iconic. Not one of my favorites because my favorites are all season one, season two. I love season one and season two. Season three, and, and I guess maybe because Larry's there so many times, you know, when Larry's gone, it's not as Beaver-centric, then it's starting to get more Wally-centric episodes. Um, I mean, the haircut is one of the greatest ones. Um, the Black Guy, you know, these are one of the first two or three episodes. The Black Eye episode. I mean, I could, I've watched that maybe 75 to 100 times. I mean... Black Eye, right? You, uh, not Black Guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Black Eye. The Black <laughs> Eye. And when he um, gets punched by Violet Rutherford and his dad teaches him how to box and says, hey, go take care of this guy who did this to you. <laughs> and, um, oh, it's hilarious. You know, I think I watched it last night. And, um, you know, I mean, the, the soup one. I mean, that's great. I mean... <sighs> I mean, there's just so many to name. I, I can't give you just Beaver Won't Eat is another one I think is, you know, it's pretty good. It's not the greatest, but but it's really well known is that he won't eat his Brussels sprouts. And one of his main talents, Brian, I saw in the book was he was hired because he had this remarkable talent of memorizing at that age. He was acting before Beaver. So he oh, was, yeah. what, who? Yeah, yeah, he was acting, he was doing modeling. His mom helped him, someone asked him to be a model for a department store. I think it was Desmond's in Los Angeles area. I may have that name wrong. But um, yeah, he was doing modeling. Then he got into some live TV. I think he did the All-Star Review um, where he did a commercial for a milk commercial. He um, And then he started doing some bits. I mean, kid actors were, it was not a really big community then in the in early 50s. And then eventually he even got the attention of Alfred Hitchcock. And so he got to do uh, The Trouble with Harry, a movie. And um, so he, um, no, he was a really good actor. And one of the things I heard him explain one time in one of his interviews is that um, he couldn't read really well. Maybe he had dyslexia. I'm not sure if that was the case, but he, so he couldn't read really well. So he would have to you know, memorize a lot of things that he had to read. He had to read in class in school. Um, like first grade or kindergarten or something like that. And so he would memorize what he had to read the next day with his mom and she'd help him. And so that's something that made him help him, you know, increase his memory. And so that was one of the things that was really interesting to learn. And, you know, um, but I know I've got some of the details wrong on that, but that was basically the case. He had to memorize things. And the cast got along even beyond the show. They all were friends, it says in the book, and all hung out right. afterwards for years. Yeah, they, I mean, and you know, you, you see this even after the new Leave it to Beaver show, um, that they would they would go out to Barbara Billingsley's house and they'd have meals, you know, all, all the cast members and um, the ones that were living, the, the, the family, you know, Tony, uh, Jerry, um, you know, Ken Osmond, Frank Bank, they'd all go out there and have Thanksgiving sometimes, or she'd go to their house. And she mentioned one time she went to Ken Osmond's house and she saw this, this Eddie Haskell, this, this creep actually lead his family in a prayer for Thanksgiving meal. And um, she goes, that was pretty amazing. You just, you wouldn't expect that from an Eddie Haskell. <laughs> all right, Sam, let's say a prayer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's a smart Alec and, and, but no, they, um, you know, Richard, Rich Carell and Jerry Mathers, who are right now at this moment in Burbank at the hotel right across from the airport. You can get there. Once you get off the air, you can fly there and go to the show. I'll be right there. And talk to them both. And they, um, they're they there today. And they're friends. They're still friends. They're good friends. And so I, mean, I think that's neat. It's really – and I think that's what's endearing about the show is that these guys are – they were remain friends with each other. Well, it's pure comfort. And the fact that it's in black and white I think matters – because it makes it even more comfort of it's black and white. Life seemed like it was black and white back then, although yeah. they were even sugarcoating things that weren't happening in the 50s and early 60s as far as Ward walking around with his tie still all the way up and the sport coat, suit coat buttoned <laughs> as he's reading the paper after work and, and your mother uh, <laughs> vacuuming in high heels. Right, yeah, that part about the vacuuming. I mean, I actually, I work with a guy at a bank out in, um, the panhandle of Texas one time. And he, um, I was told they were joking about him. He actually wore a suit to work every day, but then he would actually 
wear pants, slacks, dress. I don't know if he wore dress shoes, but slacks, belt, button down shirt. This was in the, in the 2000s, 1990s. He was mowing his lawn like that. So, I mean, I'm sure there probably were people that dressed like that back then. But, and you mentioned sugar coating, um, but they did tackle some issues at times. Um, you know, alcoholism, broken families in a couple episodes. Um, Beaver and Andy was one. Um, Beaver's buddy or old, you know, the worst camp buddy came, stayed at his house and he had, you know, multiple marriages that he had to live through, divorces. And, and so, um, so they did have some episodes like that where they did tackle things like that, but there was only a few. Well, you also have another book, a companion piece, Ward's Words, where you right. pulled quotes, some of the uh, little lectures that Ward did at the end of the show, and that's yes. all in this book. Yeah, no, that was great. That's a, a newer one. That just came out, I think, in December or November this this past year. And, um, yeah, there's like 250, about 230 quotes from Ward Cleaver and in different categories. So it's another one where you, it's not a read-through book, but you can just um, – you know, look at it, pick up something. If you want to know about education, you can look up what does he say about education? What does he say about persistence? Things like that. And and I figured, excuse me, uh, while he, um, while I was doing all that research and I had all those columns of in the in the Excel pages, and one of them was Ward's Wisdom. And I'm like, well, why not put it all together? And I want to do another one for all the characters because even Eddie Haskell has some good advice and Eddie's dad has some bad advice, but I want to put it all in a book. So that may be another one coming up maybe next December, this next November. All right. Uh, you have written other books. And I also saw when I was researching you something called some pizza website. What's that? Yeah, that, that was um, pizzaspots.com. That was a pizza website that I did. Um, it's still out there. Um, I had a cousin of mine, maybe a third cousin, twice removed or whatever, that helped start Pizza Hut. I didn't know that until after I did this pizza website, but it was a, a website dedicated to everything pizza. And um, a lot of it turned into just top 10 lists. Like I even have a list called top 10 leave it to beaver episodes to watch while eating pizza or top 10 leave it to beaver characters you'd want to share a pizza with. So, um, but that was, oh man, that was, that was quite a while ago, but it's still out there. I still okay. pay the domain name every week, every year. So, so I keep wow. it. But one of my other books that I, you know, I want to mention just because I know you have a lot of Chicagoland area viewers. And um, I wrote a book um, called Summer 1979 under a pen name. But um, the day the book starts and the character is at Disco Demolition Night. And, oh. you, and, and the main character's mom even refers to you um, as, oh, yeah, that guy in a general outfit is calling this other guy little snot nose or whatever. And, and I didn't even know that was you <laughs> when oh, I wrote that. Okay. And so, right. I, I mean, to me, you said last week, you'd be excited to talk to me. I'm like, I'm excited to talk to someone that was at disco demolition night. I mean, that's a historical baseball event. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Now your <laughs> cap, uh, if people want to Google it, I'll just say Chicago Wales. And if you want to know what that is, that's what his cap is all oh, about. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to offend any Sox or Cubs fans. So All right. Uh, Chicago, Chicago Wales. Wales. Look it up. Brian, thank you. I really enjoyed this. And the book is The World Famous Beaverpedia. Thank Every you, Gary. Everything you could possibly. I mean, really, it's so complete and fun to just. This is not a cover-to-cover -cover book. This is a book you have on your coffee table or nightstand. And when you're looking to take your mind off all the crap, you go through and pull open a page and go, oh, that's interesting. That's fun. Yeah, and I still I, I, mean, I still look at it now. I get on those Facebook groups, um, the Leave It to Beaver Fan Club Facebook group most of the time, and um, people will say something, and I'm like, okay, well, my memory is not always what it should be. I'll go back in the book, and I'll look it up, and I'm like, well, yeah, you're right, but yeah, you forgot this, this, and this. and So, yeah, I'll use it as a reference book myself, even though I wrote it. And your book is available on Amazon. Yeah, and if you want to give a copy away today, hey, go for it. I'd love oh, to Oh, okay, I'll put it in the prize package we're going to give away here now okay thanks a lot thank you brian okay appreciate it gary brian humick wait wait before brian goes but because wait, of the framing <laughs> because of the framing we can't see your website again so it is uh leave it to beaverbooks.com there we go leave it to Beaver. you can take leave it to beaver yeah. quizzes i have lots of quizzes there people can take a lot of leave it to beaver fun i'd love to know how you do gary on those quizzes <laughs> okay <laughs> all right
Yeah. Be pretty good at it, I'm sure. All right. Okay, uh, so let me also get this straight. So Richard Carell lived next to the Sharon Tate mansion. So did no, he no, catch she, she was no, he didn't live there. He spent a lot of time around oh. um in those hills there in the Hollywood Hills. Oh, because I was thinking maybe he occupied the Rick Dalton mansion, which we love so much on this show too. Rick Dalton, yeah. of course, uh once upon a time in Hollywood. Right, Leonardo, right. Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio playing that part. Great, great, movie. great movie. Who passed Watching away? God damn! Well. He's looking out the window with the with the margarita uh, <laughs> jar. Got a bunch of goddamn hippies out here. He's out there. Get that oh, mechanical Lord. asshole out of here. Oh. Great, yeah. great, great movie. So All I right. don't know how quickly Alan can manipulate, but I should have said double beaver. Um, instead, I think we're going to go with hashtag beaver. There you go. Um, okay, that's and, the, 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 the word that wins tonight. And do you want to go through what you're giving away besides so, science book? Seriously, Brian, thank you so much for making that part of today's prize package, oh, which yeah. already is pretty exciting, including Ooh, wow. a classic Mad Magazine. Wow. Uh, doesn't look like, well, I don't know. It does. I can't tell if it's been folded in back or not. But anyway, um, because St. Patty's Day is coming up, we've got some appliques for your windows, uh, nice. gel clings for St. Patty's Day. Um, we've got some temporary tattoos. tattoos. We have stuff from Tracy from Wisconsin, including bendables and a ball liquor, because we always have a ball liquor. Um, uh, Hank Corcoran gave us cook capybara. Um, we've got stuff from Oh Yes, including a guitar pick, a bracelet, and a koozie. Uh, our own Ellen Delinka provides your refrigerator magnet. Oh my God, this prize package is enormous. <laughs> and the prize that started it all, your very own wine condom. So, all right. Nikes, okay, uh, let me ask you. Do you want to do the stories? Because we are I've notified the affiliates, uh, and I'm going to play another Richard Lewis piece. So this is uh, I, running a little long. So yeah, let's I give think... away the stuff, and I'll play the Richard Lewis piece, and then well, that's the show. So we'll maybe we should Monday. do the Richard Lewis piece first, and that way that it gives a chance for everybody to join the queue. Hashtag Beaver. Right. doesn't matter if caps or anything, but yeah, just hashtag All right. Beaver. And... Um, and then, or do you want to end on the Richard Lewis note? I'll go to Alan for this. Alan, what do you think? Let's let's run the Richard Lewis stuff now. Okay, here it is. I'm I visiting with Richard Lewis. Don't of ever course. cut me off again. My First of all, my mother did it. My family did it. And that's why your wife in, and my dog do it. And that's why you're in therapy every day of the week. I love the fact that the man dresses in black, no matter what the weather in Los Angeles here, it's about 95 degrees, and here you no, are. it's 102. And, and here you are. Do you own anything besides black? No. I have to rent clothes. Let's say I'm going up for a, a biopic for Don Ho. I have to go to a store and buy white clothes. Google Don Ho, I'm sure a lot of people, I know his brother ass. So you're doing Curb Your Enthusiasm again? The ninth we're season shooting in the ninth season starts starting this fall. I'm touring starting next week. Philly, Boston. I'll be in Chicago uh, in uh, in November, and uh, you know it's Zanies for the 35th consecutive year, and they made over four hundred thousand dollars on me last time I was there. And your take was about you know three fifty. Three fifty hundred. Three hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. Three fifty hundred thousand. Yeah. You were taking Uber now for the first time this week. Yes. I got mocked because this is the first trip I took yeah. Uber. Yeah. yeah, but I I pressed the wrong button. I wanted the cheap car. This was only a mile. The guy showed up in a car that with bulletproof glass. So I it cost I mean, I, you I don't three fifty hundred. It. it cost me one hundred fifty dollars to go a mile. That's what happens. You got to get the Uber X. All right, whatever All right. you say, yeah, All right. I worship you. All right, so look for Curb, look for Richard in your town doing stand-up comedy. Chicago. The man sitting next to me has two projects going. He's got, what is it, Black is the New Pastel and Black Clothes Matter. Mr. Richard Lewis, Curb Your Enthusiasm starts again coming this fall. We're shooting in the fall, and I'm touring again. 
and I just had a near-death experience. What happened? Well, I was driving and my pedal was stuck and I went from 12 miles an hour to 120. First June NASCAR. <laughs> so uh, I, I rode around the corner. I didn't hit anybody until I pulled into my gas station and then rear-ended a Mercedes. Very nice. And who got killed? Anybody? A parakeet died. A parakeet died. died. And first of all, it would have died anyway. You should never lock your parakeet up in a heat wave. Okay, this really happened. I know some people are thinking it happened an hour you make ago. stuff up. I know, but no, this I, 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 I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm with one of my, with, with an icon. You help make me who I am, Gary, and I love you. Someone's walking by. I thought it was an assassination attempt, but it's okay. It could be. And how's your dog? My dog is fine, and every time I see anything remotely looking like a mole, I rush her to Switzerland because I want her to outlive me. Uh, she's 112, but she looks 110. And you've had a lot of surgery lately, too. I've You're had just four or five, apart. you know, not life threatening, but uh, four or five surgeries in the last five months. I picture you like Sid Dithers driving, that your head just barely gets above the steering wheel. I don't know who Sid Dithers You don't know Sid Dithers anyway, short. He what, has is he a to, cartoon? No, he was on SCTV. Oh, that's uh, Sid Dithers? Yeah, oh, Eugene okay. Levy. Oh, Eugene. Yeah. So everything else is good uh, besides the fact that you almost good. killed yourself in your car. Yes, my your wife. Your dog's 112. My wife is in, has a great business. I don't want to talk about the business. I called her. I said I almost died. And she went, thank God. Anyway, so, <laughs> uh, no, she's great. The dog is great. Everything is fantastic. I'm, this is my 48th year in show business with no small thanks to you for no hey I'm, no 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 i'm glad to help so i'll keep an eye on you if you're still alive in the next few weeks there's that man who keeps stalking nobody, me nobody can see those people well <laughs> i maybe imagined well, well, uh, there's an assassin there was nobody there all right more with richard in the coming days all right yeah you've had no influence on me whatsoever uh I have no, and I don't even have any influence on myself. All right, uh, let's uh, give away something here. Hi, Alan. You want to hit the button? All right. It's a beeb. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Here we go. Here we go. Who's going to win? Tom. <laughs> Tom right. Gerstner, you lucky schnook you. Oh, my gosh. What a massive prize package you get. Yeah, USPS Alan? is really looking forward to this one. Gary Meyer <laughs> Show at GaryMeyer.com or text 773-888-2157. Regular charges apply. Tom, please include your USPS mailing address, and Leslie and the uh, mail folks will uh, attempt to get you that package as soon as possible. And the, like the book, the Beaver book. book, the Beaver book will come from another location. So they're going to be separate. So uh, wait for that. And I hope you enjoy it. Brian, thank you. That right. was wonderful. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Leslie. All right. Have a good night. All right. We've got to give away the cannoli now. It's complimentary. Please take it. It's delicious. And what about the schnauzer, Leslie? Uh, you know, seriously, wouldn't you love to be able to plant your schnauzer right into the Beaver set on that beautifully manicured lawn and just walk along the curb with your schnauzer with one foot on the curb and one in the street. Do, 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 do. Oh, Pally. Anyway, I'm having be a beaver slash schnauzer fantasies right now. And I think we all are. Okay. And on that note, let me, uh, this is the kissing schnauzer show. There they are kissing. All right. That's it. Three in the green. Gear is down. Flaps are down. Have a great first spring weekend. The Voice of the Globe, America's podcast, The Gear Force, has landed. And that's it for all the news and nonsense here at The Gear Force. If you like that, I got other stuff I think you're going to like. This is The Gear Force. Thanks for streaming. Like, subscribe, and be kind. But no need to rewind. It sure would be terrific if you subscribe to the Gear Force Live YouTube channel. Or eyeballs. If you are watching this show recorded, that button is right here. And if you'd like to look at past episodes, try that button. Boom. Shaka laka. That's it.
All right, how do you shut this thing off?